everyone. Um, Badale is going to be giving us a Freedom Box update. Yeah, thanks very much. So thanks to all of you for getting up and being here for the first talk of the day on what is now the last day of DubConf 12. Woohoo, we made it. <coughs> um, not surprisingly, it kind of looks like all the usual suspects. Um, so out of curiosity, are any of you in the room people who have not yet had a chance to hear at least one of my talks on Freedom Box? OK, a couple of you. All right, so what I've put together for this morning is, is a little bit of what is, for me, review to sort of remind everybody what it is we're trying to accomplish and set a little bit of context. And then I'd really like to spend most of the time talking about what some of our recent progress has been. Um, in particular, it's been sort of exciting this week because we both had uh, activities underway here in Nicaragua at DebCamp and DebConf, and simultaneously, uh, there's been a freedom-oriented hack fest happening in New York City where a number of uh, Freedom Box developers were able to get together and make uh, parallel progress on other things than what we were working on here. So it's been an interesting week, and hopefully I can capture a little bit of that. Those fans are kind of exciting. Okay, so what's the problem? Out of curiosity, how many of you have a Facebook account? A Google Plus account? A Flickr account? YouTube? Yeah, okay, so um, actually I have all of those things too. Um, and in fact, in modern society, it's surprising how many of the things that we communicate with each other are being communicated through these sorts of free to us cloud-oriented services. The problem with this, though, is that we're handing an awful lot of our personal data to companies to manage on our behalf. And, and we really don't spend very much time thinking about the consequences of doing that. And we're doing this at a time when our lives are under increasing scrutiny. There is so much data being collected about us at our sort of, with our willing participation all the time and the tools for correlating all of that and acquiring knowledge based on it are getting so much better that um, this is actually sort of leading us in an interesting and, and perhaps not such a great direction. And part of the reason for that is that for-profit companies, no matter how noble the intentions that they state in their terms of service, must operate within the rules of the jurisdictions in which they operate. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you are using Facebook to organize a uh, peaceful protest in the streets of your country, and someone in your government is concerned about you doing that, they can demand that Facebook make available the list of information about who your friends are and who got the message about this. Would they want to give that information away? Probably not. Might they be forced to because they want to be able to do business in that country? We know it has happened. And lots and lots of other things like this are going on. Um, as a consequence, <coughs> um, many of us are now really quite concerned about the extent to which uh, all of us as individuals are willingly putting lots of our information in the hands of other people to manage on our behalf, in effect uh, taking free as in beer services in exchange for letting other people have access to lots and lots of information about us in a willing kind of way. So what we would like to try and accomplish in the Freedom Box project, the vision that we have, is that we would like to take all of those things that people want to be able to do today, which many of us in the free software world already know how to do using tools that we have created that are free and open and that we can inspect using distributed servers where those servers belong to us and so forth and make it possible for other people to take advantage of those things too so that we can offer alternatives to these sorts of um, free as in beer but otherwise somewhat concerning uh, centralized services. So the, uh, the vision of a Freedom Box is that it's a personal server running a free software operating system and applications that are designed to create and preserve personal privacy. And one of the parts of this vision is that we'd like these things to be able to run on cheap, power-efficient computers that individuals can afford to install and operate in their own homes. 
And part of the reason that the in their own homes thing is so important is that in many countries around the world, <clears throat> the laws around what you may do in the privacy of your own home and the burden of proof required by the authorities to obtain permission to come into your home to take something from you are very different than the regulations around what happens with data that you have willingly uploaded into you know, some other server run by somebody else in some other location. And so <clears throat> this is why you'll see that we have, we've had quite a bit of attention being given to low power ARM based plug servers and so forth. We hope in the process to contribute to building privacy respecting federated alternatives to contemporary social networks. That's a lot of big words. What we're talking about, though, is that we would like for all of the people trying to build software to do things like Facebook in a distributed manner to have a platform available that lots of people can use to be able to run that sort of software. Um, and within the Freedom Box community, there's an intense interest by at least one sub-community in the idea of mesh networking, that if we're going to give lots of people, small, low-power devices that they'll run all the time at their houses that have good wireless network interfaces, wouldn't it be nice if we could use those wireless network interfaces to establish, in effect, private backhaul networks so that if somebody takes your internet away, you don't completely lose connectivity with your peers, um, and certainly in times of natural disaster or civil unrest, that there would be an opportunity to rapidly deploy uh, replacement connectivity to allow people to, to be able to get on with doing the things they need to do. And if all of this stuff could happen, the sort of ultimate objective we have is to facilitate people collaborating safely and securely with others and building social networks that are capable of supporting demonstration, protest, and mobilization for political change. So we kind of start with this notion that, gee, we're all giving a lot of our personal data up to other people to manage on our behalf, and we sort of end up with, and if we're not careful, we're going to lose the freedom to do some things as a consequence. So can we build an infrastructure that makes it possible for us to have uh, these federated, distributed alternatives to these existing social network services? So all of this was kind of, you know, this, the, the work that we're doing was inspired um, by Eben Moglen. And in fact, uh, for many of us, uh, his keynote at DebConf 10, almost exactly two years ago today in New York City, um, was a major turning point. It's the moment when many of us sort of wrapped our brains around this and said, ah, yeah, okay, there's a problem that's worth working on. Um, it took several months after that DebConf to sort of begin to get organized. And what happened is, uh, Evan founded something called the Freedom Box Foundation. It has a small board of directors. I agreed to join that board and have uh, served on that board. Uh, that was announced, I believe, shortly after FOSDEM, roughly a year and a half ago. Um, uh, James was selected as our executive director. I agreed to put together a technical advisory committee. Uh, we began talking about this idea of creating working groups. Uh, and Eben and others began trying to find some money because our original hope was that we would be able to find enough money to be able to pay some people to do some of the difficult pieces necessary to make all of this stuff happen and then this technical advisory board uh, would try to guide the activities of those uh, people. Didn't quite work out that way. We've ended up following a different path. I'll talk about that some more as we go along. In the context of the foundation, though, what we realize very quickly is that this is more than just a free software project. If you really want this kind of technology to be able to be put in the hands of a large number of people, it has to, in the end, be something that people can buy at retail. They have to be able to walk in somewhere and buy something that says, you know, designed to be a freedom box, or this is one of several types of freedom boxes. And to do that, there, there, there's more that has to happen than just making great free software. So the first pillar of the four that we talk about in the foundation is the technology. That's the free software work. That's the stuff that I and others have been spending a lot of time on. But it's also very, very important for us to have a reasonable user experience. Um, for example, you know, one simple example is it's pretty clear to us that using GPG keys as the root of identification and trust within the Freedom Box network makes lots of sense. But the GPG command line interface is sort of you know, one of those 
horrors from the seventh circle. Um, uh, in fact, even this week, people here at DevConf who really understand this stuff have been struggling to make sure that they had all the right options set when they were creating keys so that they had all the right attributes. This is clearly a place where there's an opportunity for us to make contributions towards uh, having the software be <coughs> uh, more tractable to people beyond our geeky friends. And so user experience at all levels uh, user interface design and so forth is something that we've been focusing on. And I'm pleased that after a fairly long dry spell, we finally had some people who know what they're doing uh, helping us to make some progress on this. Uh, you can't run a foundation without making you know, some noise about what you're doing and trying to raise some money. Um, if anything, this is sort of interestingly the place where I think we've fallen down some over the last year. I've been giving talks about Freedom Box and what we're doing at lots of different conferences. But we realized recently that we've been remiss at doing things like going back and posting updates on the Kickstarter site to let the folks who supported us early in getting the money together to start the foundation know what was happening. Um, there's been lots and lots of discussion on our mailing lists, lots of things going on in our wikis. Our IRC channel has occasional bursts of activity. Um, but somehow, you know, we lacking somebody who's focused on doing the, the public relations bit, uh, not all of that has been sort of brought together and communicated back to uh, all the folks that have been interested in our project as we might uh, have liked. So we're going to try and fix that going forward. And then finally, there's this pillar of the work at the foundation that I call industry relations. Um, this is sort of a euphemism for working with hardware folks. <clears throat> And the problem is, if you want to work with people like system-on-chip manufacturers and the device manufacturers who build products using uh, those systems-on-chip, you often have to be willing to sign non-disclosure agreements with them to talk about what they want to do in the future. And I think we all understand that there's sort of an incompatibility between doing that and working on free software. There is, in fact, an inappropriateness in expecting a free software developer to be willing to sign broad non-disclosure agreements. So one of the things that the foundation has been able to do is to go talk to some of these organizations to interact with some hardware developers. I actually have some very, uh, there's some very exciting news in that area. We are actually making progress towards uh, some interesting hardware. But all of that can only happen um, if people uh, are able to have those kinds of conversations and those kinds of, of circumstances. And that's something the foundation can do and act as sort of an interface between that other world around hardware and those who would like to just work on software. Um, I won't belabor the, the membership of the Technical Advisory Committee. It's actually not been where the bulk of the excitement has been recently. Um, there are a set of working groups. Um, different of these working groups have been more or less active than others. But uh, as I reported uh, when I first started, uh, there's been quite a bit of progress made recently at a couple of hack fests organized in New York City um, and things that have been happening here. And these represent several of the different working groups. OK, so <clears throat> enough about the foundation and its structure. When we began this work, we made a few early decisions. And those decisions have sort of shaped the way progress in the project has gone since then. The first thing we did is we decided that we really had to bound the challenge a little bit. It's very easy when you start talking about Freedom Box for lots of people to have lots of great ideas. And before you know it, you have this huge sort of realm of possibility. But somehow you have to pick a path through that. So one of the early decisions was let's focus on software, not building a piece of custom hardware. In hindsight, I'm not really sure that was a great decision. I'll talk about that some more later. The second, but, but at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do because, after all, software is something that you know, lots of people in our community know how to work on. And hardware is kind of a pain in some ways. And there were elements of hardware we could go buy that would do pretty much what we wanted. We also chose to focus on servers and services, not client devices. Uh, I would love for there to be completely free software, privacy, and freedom-loving phones, too. But that's not the focus of the Freedom Box project. And we decided we would be a platform dis for federated distribu distributed social networks. We were not ourselves trying to build a federated distributed social network. There are other people working on interesting software stacks. If we could provide them with a platform on which their software could run, that would be another good way to sort of bound this. 
exactly what that means in the long term as we start to accumulate, accrete, and integrate more software, you know, that will change over time, but for now, these were sort of bounding conditions. And then the other big decision we made, it was there, there was a lot of discussion for a long time about, well, gee, you can't possibly actually be free and be insulated from um, you know, denial of service attacks from your government if you depend on the domain name system, for example. And to some extent, that's true. But again, you have to sort of decide how many problems you think you can solve at once. Uh, in HP, where I work, uh, there used to be a, a wonderful saying that we would limit ourselves to no more than one miracle per product. <clears throat> and, you know, this is one of those places where choosing to bound the number of miracles we're trying to, to have happen all at once seems appropriate. So why is it that this is all sort of being done in the context of Debian? Well, I suspect at DebConf, I don't need to spend much time talking about why Debian makes sense for Freedom Box. Anyone have any questions about that? Yeah, okay, great. Um, but the flip side of this is, I think, equally important. We decided uh, very early on that we wanted to deliver Freedom Box ultimately via Debian. And what I mean by that is that I wanted future stable releases to just have everything needed for Freedom Box available in the distribution out of the box that we would build the Freedom Box with Debian packages, that all new software that was created for the Freedom Box would be packaged and delivered via Debian. The real motivation for this, frankly, is that no matter how successful we as a project were, all of our work would survive, remain available, and be easy for other people to aggregate and incorporate and think about and use in the context of creating other uh, devices and other services that would enhance and, and preserve personal privacy and freedom. In all honesty, in recent months, I think we've been, you know, my report card on this would be maybe a C plus or a B minus. Um, as I'll report in a little bit, there's been substantial progress towards getting the hardware enablement support um, for the initial platform we chose into Debian, but some of the software that's been developed for Freedombox is still basically living on individual people's laptops or in their GitHubs, and some of it hasn't been packaged yet. And that, frankly, is where going forward from here, now that we have some, some sort of positive results and some milestones that were reached in the Hackfest this week in New York, um, I'm really looking forward to spending some time in the near future helping to get the rest of those pieces packaged and in. This is still the objective. Right now, today, when we build images, there are three or four things that we're pulling, you know, source repos of to build from instead of building them out of Debian packages. And I'm a little personally disappointed in that, but we'll get past it. Okay, so hardware. Well, I said initially that <clears throat> this is going to be about software, not about hardware. But the problem is that we made some commitments to people in the Kickstarter campaign that we would deliver them some actual Freedom Box hardware. And in order to be able to demonstrate uh, that we could actually deliver on the promise of making stuff work on low power, physically small, <coughs> low cost servers, uh, we sort of had to pick something to use for that. So the initial hardware target for the reference implementation of Freedom Box that was chosen is the dream plug from Global Scale Technologies. Um, I have a couple of them in my bag here. Let me pull one out just so you have a sense of physical scale. Um, this, that's a dream plug. Some of you have seen me this week working with this with other people in the hack labs. Actually, that's the power supply, that's the server. And um, this takes five volts in at some modest number of milliamps, and I have very successfully run one of these for a number of hours on four AA batteries when doing a demo in Brazil. And so this actually is a very functional, very useful um, ARM system on chip based server with modest amounts of storage capability, bunch of interfaces and all of that as you can see here on the list, um, and it does run on really low power. And the low power thing is more important than you might suspect because there are some geographies where power is just not as reliable and available as many of us are accustomed to. And the notion that you can run something off batteries that you charge during the portions of the day when you can get access to some sort of utility power or solar panels or whatever, and then run off those batteries the rest of the time is important. It's also true that for some of our um, peripheral objectives around making it possible for people to use devices like this uh, to build network supporting political and social change, 
that the idea that you can drop nodes into interesting places with a little bit of battery on them and get you know many hours or even days of use out of them is fairly exciting. Uh, for those watching the streams that couldn't see the hardware real well, that's what one looks like with sort of an artist rendition of the old Freedom Box logo on it. Um, but the problem with picking an existing device that was available is we ran into all of the problems that everybody trying to do anything with free software on devices like this run into. Um, and as you can imagine, deciding that you're going to build a software stack in a project inspired by Evan Moglin on hardware that has GPL violations just isn't going to happen. So unfortunately, um, we spent more time than I would have liked to chasing these things down. Uh, we were, in the end, able to resolve all of them. My only remaining frustration is that the micro access point wireless chip that's in these devices, and which is in the same family as the part that was used in the original OLPC uh, XO notebook machines, requires an out-of-tree kernel driver because it uses some non-standard uh, interfaces and their kernel community really doesn't want that driver in their tree. Not a huge big deal, just kind of annoying. Has to be packaged separately, can't be part of the kernel source tree. But there's lots of other interesting hardware out there and the last thing I want to have happen is for people to say, oh, you know, some limitation of the Dream Plug is an ultimate limitation of the Freedom Box. There are other plug servers out there. Uh, many of the folks working on the Freedom Box project also have Shiva plugs, which are the earlier plug server generation from global scale. It actually has very similar specs. It has the JTAG interface integrated, which developers like me really like. Um, there's something called the Tenito plug that I played with one of. Um, it's kind of interesting. It has one less wired network interface, but it has room for an internal two and a half inch SATA you know, notebook style drive. Um, that's pretty cool for making a portable, deployable file server in a hurry. Uh, I think it actually might be very interesting before DebConf next year for us to think about uh, whether some of the conference infrastructure could usefully be deployed on one or another set of these sorts of devices. We've actually done really well, I think, this year with um, getting to the point where all the services we expect to have working at a DebConf have been in pretty good shape, but there's been a lot of running around to try and make that happen. And I, one of the things I'm personally scratching my head about is whether we might be able to help uh, an event like this uh, be even easier to set up and quicker to deploy if we had you know, some of these sorts of devices around. I don't know. There are a lot of set-top boxes um, that have sort of fast video interfaces too and less networking that are also based on low power ARM devices. Some of those can be relevant. And you know, and look, on some level, because of this objective and approach we're taking of having everything integrated into Debian, any hardware that can run Debian can ultimately uh, serve as a Freedom Box. And as I was discussing with somebody over breakfast this morning, you could even run a Freedom Box instance in a virtual machine if you want. There's no reason that that can't happen and can't work. But as I mentioned earlier, sort of the fundamental objectives we have at the foundation is to make these be devices that people can afford to buy and deploy in large numbers in their personal residences on their own networking where they've got control. Okay. So that's all sort of background context, things that many of you I'm sure have heard me talk about before. Let me talk now about some things that sort of qualify as recent progress. Um, Nick Daly went to work and built this thing called Santiago and then there's sort of a user interface called Freedom Buddy on top of it. Um, this is a service discovery and, and, and management protocol. Um, it's designed to make it easy for people's freedom boxes to find each other and for people to share services with each other without actually having to know a whole lot about where the other person is on the network or things like that. Uh, it uses open PGP sign and encrypted messages over an HTTPS connection to reduce the uh, sort of the attack surface for man in the middle attacks. Um, the mode in which it's being used at the moment most often is that you establish a single Tor onion address for uh, the other Santiago instance that you're interested in interacting with or the set of them that you are. And then these devices can use the Tor network to establish initial contact with each other. I personally have not had time to spend much, uh, to put much attention into this code or to play with it very much. Everybody that's using it seems to be really excited about it. I'm looking forward to spending more time with it. The first release candidate was actually announced in mid-May of this year, so not terribly long ago. 
Um, and this is now part of Nick's weekly builds of images based on uh, the Freedom Maker tool set that I started working on a little over a year ago. Uh, here at DevConf 12 and DevCamp over the last week and a half, the most exciting milestone that I can report is that hardware support for Dreamplug is now in Wheezy. <clears throat> um, Friday night a week ago, uh, Hector Oron and I sat down and got the last little bit of the Flash kernel config stuff done. Um, this is the utility that knows how to uh, manage kernel images and init RD uh, images uh, and create the config files needed for booting devices like this. Um, we got that done, we got it uh, uploaded, we got it unblocked, and I was pleased to discover yesterday that the kernel images we need and flash kernel are actually in testing now. And so yesterday, um, we were successful at doing some testing uh, using those files entirely uh, coming from testing. Um, the user space tools for the Marvell user ac uh, micro access point I packaged at DevConf last year, those are also in testing. Uh, we have not packaged, we've not done the separate packaging of the device driver for those yet. Um, the kernel packages that we were using until a couple of weeks ago um, were an out of tree build that included that driver in the kernel image package. Now that we've switched over to using the Debian pre-built Kirkwood kernel image packages, uh, we need to get that driver uh, turned into a module assistant -able um, driver package. It shouldn't be hard. We might even get that done today. Um, and then hopefully that can also be on the way to being released. And then thanks in part to uh, Ian doing some quick work on config bits and pieces. Uh, we were yesterday uh, underway in testing uh, Debian installer. Um, given where we are in the uh, beta one uh, schedule for that, I think what we'll try to do, uh, it sounded like the right answer was to try and merge those changes after the impending beta release, which means that hopefully by the time of the Wheezy Debian installer beta 2 release, um, that support for the Dream Plug would just be included. So for me personally, since I've been focusing some of my time, available time, on trying to get all this hardware enablement stuff done, this is a really huge milestone. I'm really excited about it. It follows through on that sort of commitment I made to myself more than a year ago uh, that we would have the Dream Plug and the rest of the Freedom Box stack supportable in the next Debian stable release and turns that into something that's now actually true. And in parallel, um, there's been a lot, I've been doing a lot of work on the Freedom Maker tool um, because a lot of what it was doing was frobbing around with kernel bits and so forth. And now that we can use the packaged kernel and flash uh, kernel bits from the distro, um, I've been making updates to that. Um, Nick Daly's been working his tree in parallel at the Hackfest, and there's a little bit of merging that needs to happen. He and I were chatting on IRC about that last night. And again, hopefully over the next day or three, a lot of that will get done. So as I mentioned, in parallel with what's been happening here at DebConf uh, and DebCamp, uh, this week there was also a Hackfest held in New York City. Um, I don't know a huge amount about exactly what went on there. I got a quick update yesterday, um, and my understanding is that this involved not only people working on Freedom Box, but lots of people interested in related software. Um, and so these folks were all hanging out on other communications channels than our normal hash freedom box channel on OFTC. So we had a little less um, live communication during these parallel events than I might have hoped for, and we might try in the future to do that a little better. But there's some really interesting results. Um, one of the things we want to include in the initial images is a Privoxy installation. And James had built this really large Privoxy config with a lot of regex, and apparently, uh, some folks spent some time going through and validating those, and um, the confidence level in the suitability of that Privoxy config went up a bunch in the last week. Again, uh, you know, <clears throat> until we have a little more thorough detail on what happened, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I'm hoping that that means we'll very shortly be in a position to either package or to offer that config up as an alternate uh, config for the standard Debian Privoxy package. Um, so work was done on this sort of first boot experience for a plug server running Freedom Box software. As you can imagine, um, a lot of these devices don't have a user interface in the sense of a keyboard and graphics display. And so what exactly it should do when you turn it on for the first time and how you should access that has been a topic of much discussion. 
I have opinions about this. I don't know exactly what they decided at the Hackfest made the most sense. Supposedly, somebody's put some slides together describing what should happen in the sequence of that. I hope that that, will, that that deliverable will be shared sometime in the next day or three, and we can find out what they decided was a good idea and go forward from there. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's been quite a bit of work happening on user interface. Uh, James wrote a Python framework called Plinth um, that <coughs> is a wonderfully lightweight, web access-oriented user interface construction toolkit thing. Um, it's one of those deals where if you want to add another function to the user interface, you write a little code fragment, put it in the right directory, and it automatically assembles those into a user interface. Uh, there's quite a bit of work done, apparently, on that in the last week, um, connecting some of the Plinth UI pieces together to the actual action scripts that do things on the system. I have not, since I just found out about this last night, I haven't had a chance yet to go look and see what, if anything, from that work has actually been pushed into their repos yet. But I hope we'll be able to fold that into images very soon. Uh, apparently, Nick also worked on a command line interface to his Freedom Buddy thing so that that's easier to configure and use. Uh, I don't know exactly what that means yet, but we'll find out soon. One of the things we've talked about quite a bit is making it possible to have automatic configuration or you know, better configuration of using OpenVPN as a way to access your own Freedom Box from some kind of client device. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of us now are running smartphones that are using you know, alternate builds of Android, like CyanogenMod, which comes with OpenVPN client support out of the box. Uh, being able to take advantage of that is a, a way to have a reasonably secure connection to your local box uh, seems important. And of course, OpenVPN is well supported in Debian. So uh, my hope is that the work that they've done will actually you know, be a big step in that direction. Uh, Jason Cooper, who helped us a lot over the last year with getting uh, the U-boot pieces uh, merged and upstreamed, and who also uh, helped get some of the um, Dreamplug-specific kernel content merged in the kernel.org tree, also uh, has been using OpenVPN in this sort of way and has described to me the config that he's using. So between those two streams of consciousness, I hope that sort of all comes to a useful conclusion fairly soon. And I understand there was also quite a bit of work done in New York on internationalization support, starting to add uh, multilingual support both to the Plinth UI and to some of the other pieces in the system. I guess to the Freedom Buddy tool as well. So where do we go from here? Well, <clears throat> we have started to talk about Freedom Box 1.0 and to describe a set of features that we think it really should deliver. This has been revised and, and updated quite a bit uh, since other talks I've given in the past. Um, and to some extent, <clears throat> what's happened is we have, we've sort of realized the difficulty of achieving some of the things that we had hoped initially might be simple and obvious. And so what we have now is a defined set of deliverables for Freedom Box 1.0 is a privoxy configuration with a rich set of rules that I was just talking about. Um, the value of this is that if you're going to deploy a Freedom Box as a replacement for an existing uh, wireless access point or firewall or router device of some type, um, using privoxy, we can help provide additional uh, privacy and security enhancements for all of your other client devices routing their traffic through your Freedom Box, regardless of whether you actually take advantage of other capabilities that we might deploy. And that seems like a really worthwhile thing to be able to do. So one of the th deliverables that we want to be part of this is a richly configured Privoxy instance that people can use to increase the privacy and security of all of their uh, web interactions. As I just mentioned, <coughs> um, we're hoping to have a, a nice open VPN config for uh, client connections. Wouldn't necessarily be the only way you could interact with the box, um, but it seems like a really good choice. Uh, the Santiago slash Freedom Buddy stuff will be integrated to make it easy for people to start to set up and share services with each other. Um, and the Plinth user interface with modules, at least to support initial setup, some uh, DHCP style configuration things, uh, sort of minimum set of controls you need for configuring Tor and so forth should all be part of that. Exactly how much of that is implemented and you know, how much more beyond that might be part of the Plinth interface by the time we you know, get to something I might start thinking of as a 1.0 remains to be seen. 
So going forward from here, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do sort of period, periodic releases of a reference implementation, uh, sort of to finish inter integrating the user interface framework. Um, we're very interested in sort of <coughs> integrating more Monkey Spheres style uh, functionality and other SSH tricks, whether those things will actually be done you know, by the time we declare something 1.0, I don't know. I've talked in the past about the desirability of building a secure XMPP-based chat stack. We've backed off of that slightly, um, at least for the short term, until we figure out the client access to the device piece a little bit better. It may be that once we have the open VPN configuration to a point where it all makes sense that putting this back on the list of things to deliver is easy because after all, we've got things like JW Chat as an Apache hosted XMPP client and good XMPP servers in Debian. Um, it just, uh, the approach that we were talking about using of trying to uh, support GPG key based access to the local node to have an initial chat service uh, just turned out to seem a whole lot more complicated than what anybody really wanted or needed right away. So we kind of backed away. I'm hoping we'll come back to that once we uh, get the client access piece working. Um, then I hope over time that we can work up the stack and add more applications. In parallel, uh, various folks have been talking to me here about supporting other platforms. I think one of the more interesting things to work on would be to add back in or add in uh, explicit support for creating some x86 virtual images, virtual client images to the Freedom Maker tool. Uh, again, we have, we've had a couple of conversations here at DebConf about ways of doing that. Um, Lars had done some work a while back on a tool for creating uh, virtualized client images that was sort of in parallel with and never got integrated with Freedom Maker. Uh, now that Nick Daly's done the work to build micro SD card images and integrated that into Freedom Maker, I think we actually have most of the pieces around that we need. Um, <clears throat> and I'm hoping, again, that just a little bit of work will, will help us make that happen. And for lots of people who don't actually want to have to fumble around with an ARM-based device in the short term, this could be a really, I think, helpful way to uh, uh, enable people to help us work up the stack and, and get more things done. Another thing that I'm personally working on, I mentioned earlier that the decision we made to not do purpose-built hardware early on is one that I have questioned a couple of times since then. And part of the reason for that is that I realized at some point the amount of time that I'd personally spent futzing around dealing with GPL compliance issues on other people's hardware w exceeded the amount of time that I think I personally would have needed to take some new piece of purpose-built hardware and bring it up and get an operating system stable and happy on it. In fact, even in the last week, the amount of fumbling we've done dealing with U-boot flag day issues with kernel configs and all this, <clears throat> somehow when you're trying to deal with somebody else's hardware, um, all of this just ends up being immensely frustrating. And if it's hardware that you've built and are, are turning on, it's immensely exciting. And that's a huge difference. It's also the case that somehow um, I think it's been we, we've had a, a difficult time um, providing a focal point for people to rally around within the project. And I'm hoping that um, as I start to have a little bit more time to focus on Freedom Box in, in coming weeks and months, um, that maybe we can resolve that in any case. But I'm really tickled that at least one credible hardware development community is now actively working on a purpose-built device for projects like Freedom Box and Tor um, for the future. And it's going to have some really neat hardware capabilities in particular. A lot of attention is being paid to details like hardware random number generation, the ability to do precise time stamping, and, and other things that turn out to be really helpful and useful for building the kinds of, of services that we're interested in. There's also been a lot of discussion about this notion of creating some kind of a free phone instance. This is peripheral to and sort of different than what we're trying to accomplish with Freedom Box, but you know, there have been a bunch of attempts to try and build an open phone from scratch. Uh, many of you here, I think, have done open MoCo things in the past, and it would have been nice if any one of those really achieved critical mass and became really useful. Do you have a question? Um, just want to advertise a boff later in the day. There's the Debian mobile boff. Anyone right. who's interested in Freedom Phone stuff should probably come to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's absolutely true. 
Um, I put this slide together before that happened. I just wanted to observe that um, the fact that HP made a decision a few months back to release all of the WebOS bits and pieces uh, under Apache 2 licensing and that that work has been proceeding and uh, they are anticipated to complete um, that process in a very short number of weeks from now uh, means that there's another interesting sort of code base available there that we could try to maybe do something interesting with over time. This is not something I'm planning to work on. I've got sort of too many projects in the queue already, but several of us here at DevConf have talked in various contexts, including in the, the mobile boff about what to do here. I'd really like to see somebody come up with a truly free client device that we could all actually get excited about and you know, be able to, to run on a bunch of devices. So what can you do to help? Well, the first thing I'd like to ask all of you to do is please be conscious about privacy and your other freedoms in everything that you do. I suspect everybody involved with Debian does have a GPG key now. If you don't, get with the program. Join a working group. There's a lot of interesting discussion, uh, sub things happening within the Freedom Box community. If you can actually get to one of the hack fests, which have mostly been in places like New York and San Francisco so far, but you know could certainly happen in other places as well, um, please do that. It's an excellent opportunity to meet and work directly with other people who are excited about this stuff. Um, please, there, there's you know all there, there's a bunch of wiki content uh, under the Freedom Box portion of the Debian wiki. Um, some of that could use updating. Lots of it, uh, though, is directly relevant. Um, you could certainly help me out a lot by helping me to select Debian packages and getting the configuration specifics right to deliver the various things that are part of our vision. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the foundation is a nonprofit in the U.S. It's actually, um, for financial purposes, associated with software in the public interest, and financial contributions are always welcome. Um, wouldn't be me if I didn't throw, you know, one of my <coughs> uh, sort of thought-provoking quotes for the day uh, in this one from Ben Franklin. Uh, many of you have probably seen this before. They who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Um, every time we take advantage of a free service, we need to remind ourselves that nothing is ever free. What is it that you're actually uh, giving up in order to have the right to use that service from that cloud service provider. In a lot of cases, you are willingly or unwillingly giving them the ability to mine an awful lot of information about you as an individual. And in the process, you're making it possible for lots of other people to get access to that information about you that you might not have even thought about. I don't want to spend any more time today you know, on the scary part of this, but I hope that as we go forward, everybody becomes and remains conscious about these things and continually looks for ways to take all of the good stuff that we have done and that we have developed in the free software world and make it more available to our peers beyond our community so that uh, we can have a freer, safer, more distributed, and more robust uh, network experience going forward. With that, uh, we've got a few minutes left. I'll be happy to take some questions. You can find more information about the foundation at freedomboxfoundation.org, including a report uh, that was just posted on the Hackfest in New York. And most of the technical details of what's going on are one way or another under the wiki.wn.org Freedom Box page. OK, question? Yes. Um, I see that one of the motivations you've, you've mentioned is that the importance of private and secure communications for people in a political context. And, and I support that. That's all well and good. Um, but I believe that it's also just as relevant to people in um, entrepreneurial pursuits, in, in free enterprise. Um, to make an example, there was a recent, um, there was a, Apple released their um, iCloud, iTunes match type service. Um, where someone had actually submitted an app very similar to that to Apple six or 12 months before. Apple sat on the app and then they released something just like it. Um, I mean, this is an example of, of big corporates sucking up people's ideas. Sure. No one knows whether Apple was already working on it or whether they duplicated the guy's idea. Um, but this is another area where this should be getting people excited about Freedom Box. There's a lot of people who may not 
identify with um, political protest. There's a lot of people in my country, in Australia, who live a very comfortable life um, and they're not politically active like the people in Libya or Syria. Um, but they still have reason to be concerned about surveillance and monitoring and, and big corporates. And, and so maybe we need to wake up those types of concerns as well. Well, so my hope is that as we actually begin to deliver bits that are useful to users, um, that will start to grow sort of the community of interest. It's absolutely true that those of us sort of in the core of the project and uh, in the core of the activities surrounding the foundation have a particular combination of motivations. Um, I certainly hope, as I mentioned, that by doing the work the way we're doing it, um, that all of the things we're working on help to, you know, sort of enhance lots of different activities. Um, I've commented before that if we were going to start this over again, you know, calling it the Freedom Box Project instead of calling it the, you know, Debian Uber Freedom Privacy Project, and we could have all sorts of discussions about, you know, what, what will the net effect be versus what was the initial set of thoughts and vision. But you're absolutely right. There are lots and lots of things that the work we're doing hopefully will, will help people with. Thomas, you had a question? Yes. When the Freedom Box project started, uh, one of the ideas of software was having a backup so that I could save, let's say, my laptop's files on my buddy's Freedom Box, encrypted there and, multiple, on, and distribute in a distributed way so that we could have redundancy. Has any progress made, be, has been made on, on that side? I've personally had conversations with Zuko O'Hearn and others in the Tahoe Laughs project about the suitability of the file system work that they've been doing to a Freedom Box kind of structure. And we all agree that at some point building the back end piece to make it possible for that to be a you know, securely distributed file system that runs on top of um, Freedom Boxes makes a lot of sense. Um, it's a place where work could stand to be done. Um, the nice thing about the Tahoe Laugh stuff is it appears to me to provide the right kind of user interface, um, so the right sort of layer um, to allow the uh, sharing of uh, redundant data across different boxes to happen in a way where, um, you know, I can agree to provide you some backup service for your data, but I don't ever actually have to see any of that data, that, that you know, those objects are encrypted in an appropriate place in the API and the redundancy mechanism. Uh, is in place so that the loss of a single node doesn't cause the data to go away and all that sort of thing. Um, in all honesty, though, it has not, I don't think a lot of work's been done on that yet. So if that's an area you're particularly interested in, I would certainly encourage you to, to dive in and help. I'm happy to make, to help make contacts between people to make sure that, you know, the, the right folks are talking to the right folks to, to be able to make progress. And anytime somebody hands me a, hey, look, this is shiny and it works, would you put it into the config? If it makes sense, I'm happy to, you know, work with Nick Daly and others to get those things folded into um, our Freedom Maker tool set and become part of the reference images we're building. Tom. So as you're working on free hardware, what are your thoughts about BIOS or bootloaders, in particular Core Boot or any of the other free BIOS-like alternatives? Uh, the fewer bits that run between turning the hardware on and having a Linux kernel up, the happier I am. Time's out. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and attention and to all those who are watching remotely. Um, I will be around the rest of today here at DebConf. I'll be in the Hack Lab when I'm not in talk sessions. Please feel free to come by and ask other questions or talk about things that you'd like to work on or would like to contribute. And uh, beyond that, thank you very much again for your time and attention.